Welcome to A State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I am delighted to be joined by Stuart Braithwaite to talk about your new book, Stuart. And before we get started, I've got to congratulate you on a fantastic read. Thanks when did you much. decide I'm going to put all this down in writing? Um, I'd been asked quite a long time ago about writing a book, but it wasn't something I ever um, imagined myself doing. And it was a few years back when gigs stopped, and I was reading a lot, got really into reading, and... Um, I realised I'd had an awful lot of spare time and I was thinking of things I could do during the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got back in touch with Lee, the publisher at White Rabbit and checked he wasn't kidding me on. And uh, yeah, he, he asked me to write a chapter and I just started from there. Then I phoned up a few author friends, asked them how long a book was. And uh, I just kind of got my head down and got, got tore in. I love the title, uh, Spaceships Over Glasgow. I think that becomes quite clear. The meaning of that as you read through the book, but also I love the design. Could you tell us a wee bit about that before we get stuck into the content? Yeah, the, the cover was designed by a friend of mine called Gordon Reed. Um, not the famous uh, Paralympic tennis player. They do get confused on Twitter sometimes, but he's a great graphic designer. And um, yeah, he came up with a bunch of designs and that was the one that the... The publishers went with it's quite unusual. Doesn't have my ugly pus on the front, which is probably a, <laughs> probably a benefit. I was just saying that though, but normally that that would be the go-to front cover, wouldn't it, for the autobiography? Yeah. But um, it's it's a great uh, music journal for sure. But it opens up with the line, "I wasn't born into music." But yeah. you were born into a, a household that um, gave you the freedom to thrive, didn't it? Yeah, my, my, my dad made telescopes. He was Scotland's only telescope maker. My mum was a, a GP. So they were busy doing all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, me and my sister both got really into music. And yeah, my folks just let us go on with it really, which uh, was great and very supportive of, of what we both got into. My sister's actually now a um, great artist. She's a painter, Victoria Braithwaite. And, uh, yeah, no, my folks have always been really supportive. Throughout this book, Stuart, um, your big sister features a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. She was the sibling that you were able to pull for the records uh, mm -hmm. collections. But she helped you in your quest to go to gigs, to go yeah. to festivals. How influential was she really when you look back? Huge, huge. And um, I'm very lucky because she had really good taste in music. And because of that, I kind of skipped probably a lot of phases that a lot of people have where they're into, I don't know, heavy, me heavy metal or pop or, or, or whatever. Mm. Not that there aren't great pop and heavy metal bands, but they're not usually the ones folk are into when they're 14 and 15. So I, I got kind of introduced to the really great music at, at a young age. And as you said, she was really supportive of um, taking me to gigs, taking me to festivals, all that kind of stuff, which was great. And it was Great she did it, but also great my, my folks let us, which is very nice. Oh, definitely. Um, I also find it interesting that your grandfather, as well as playing in goals for Hamilton Ackies, he went to fight Franco. He so did. in your household, was it quite politicised? Very politicised, yes. As, as you can imagine, my family, very left-wing, very um, anti-fascist, obviously from my granddad very anti-nuclear weapons mm. um, and uh, very pro-Scottish independence. So these were always things uh, very anti-Tory. So I always kind of grew, grew up um, around very passionate people. You know, a lot of my parents' friends were through political a activism and, uh, yeah, always, always surrounded by interesting folk and folk with very passionate beliefs. You know, I think... You see a lot of the kind of mainstream politicians now, and I mean, this half wit we've got as Prime Minister just now, like not that long ago, was like anti monarchy and mm -hmm. in a different political party. And now she's a and she campaigned against Brexit, and now she's literally flip flopped on every single one. And you're like, what, what does anybody stand for these days? But anyway, it's another conversation, isn't it? But it is an interesting point that you make sure because I think a lot of people who have got platforms, people who have become successful through the arts are sometimes a wee bit afraid to put their political colours and, and, you know, nail them to the mask. But you're not afraid to do that. You do that on social media quite a bit. I do, yeah. And 
you sometimes get a bit of stick, but I think I think that especially when there's things I really care about, like I really I really care about uh, nuclear disarmament and Scottish independence, and I'd I'd rather I'd rather put one or two folks' noses out of joint while at the same time changing a few people's minds, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not they're not whimsical ideas to me. They're they're things that I've thought about quite deeply, and um, yeah, I'm 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 definitely not not shy of sharing sharing my opinions. I mean, yeah, as long as you're willing to accept a few jabs back once in a while. I mean, I've seen you get a wee bit of feistiness. Just a bit. Aye. Just I mean, a bit. Once you, put your, once you put yourself out there, there's always a chance that you may get a bit of a hard time, but I'm all right with that. For sure. Um, as I say, spaceships over Glasgow, I find it really interesting that there was a moment in your life where you um, had almost a, an epiphany, um, and it was to David Bowie, Starman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take us back to that, and how how did that kind of change the way that you looked at music? Well, I think I mean my, my folks did like music; they liked folk music and um, some c classical and opera, a wee bit, mostly folk music. But it was the first time that, that I heard something, and it just stopped me in my tracks. And it was Starman. I was I was a kid. I was a wee wee boy. It was a doing past the par, past the parcel. But I remember just thinking, "Wow, that's that's something else." And it's funny about that song because I'm a wee bit too young. But I've heard so many people talk about his top of the pops performance of that as be, and he came out and very androgynous, which was very unusual at the time as well. And obviously, a brilliant song looked unlike anything. And that was back in the days when there was only three channels, mm -hmm. so everybody would have been watching it. You know, so yeah, it's it, it, you hear so much about that song, but it definitely blew my mind, as it says in the song. No, oh, definitely. I mean, again, we've spoke about the inspiration and influence of your sister. Um, there were various bands you were reading in the pages, the, the likes of the NME, the Melody Maker, um, and uh, you fell in love. You were obsessed. You say in your book by a band called The Cure. Yeah. Um, and it was your mission to go and see them live. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us your recollection of getting to that gig and the impression it made on you? Well, they were, they were my favourite band. They probably still are my favourite band. Made so many brilliant records. But just at, at that perfect age when I started to realise that music wasn't just a thing that existed, but music was something that happens every week. I started reading the music papers and I found out that they had a new record coming out and disintegration this has been late uh, late 80s and I it's the first album I bought before that I'd just been copying my sister's records um, and they also were playing a gig in Glasgow and I just really wanted to go I had a video of them playing in France The Cure in Orange and I just watched it a million times and yeah I went to high school in Straven and uh, there was a bus ran from not from the school but it was kids kids that went to the school that were all on the bus and uh yeah, it was an amazing experience. The the bus driver, my pal Mog, who's a wee bit older than me, like sneaked a carry out onto the bus and with cans of beer inside a acoustic guitar that the bus driver promptly made them pour out. And we were all terrified that we weren't going to get to the gig. But yeah, it was an amazing experience. I grew up in the countryside as well, so I'd never really been out about a massive amount of people. I hadn't, at that point, I had been at a football game, so I'd never been around tens of thousands or even thousands of people so there was this experience of being around an awful lot of people into the same thing mm -hmm. everybody looking a bit weird me and my pals all looked a bit weird that was the that was the fashion at the time and uh, yeah it was amazing and then the, the band came on and just blew us away just so loud and just looking amazing just they had um, I remember reading not that long ago, they had the same people that had designed Prince's um, stage stage sets. It was all lasers and ev ev everything. It was full on and really emotional music and absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Fast forward a wee bit. It must be strange to finally, you know, support The yeah. Cure in your own band, uh, yeah. meet the lead singer who uh, was iconic. He had the hair, he had the look, everything about yeah. him was iconic. Yeah, yeah. But does it happen so gradually that it doesn't come as a shock when it finally happens? 
No, I'm, I mean, I'm such a fan. I'm just a music fan more than anything. I mean, you do get to a point where you know someone so well, they're just a friend. I'm not a very, very close friend of Robert Smith, but I would consider him a friend. And uh, But yeah, I was still... I mean, there's a picture in the book of me standing with Robert Smith the, the first time we played with him, and you can tell I'm just like, this is unbelievable. This is... Could not get the grin off my face. And, and he's someone that doesn't let you down. He's a nice guy. He's been very supportive of us. The label, he's got the Twilight Sad out on tour just now. Um, uh, and some people, not everyone's not everyone's brand new. Some people can be a wee bit of a um, a let down, but, but no, he's 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 a really good guy. But it, it definitely, it, it didn't seem normal. No, because it was, and, and a few, that was a lot of people, a lot of the people that I've got to meet through music are people that I had posters of, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And, at the end of the day, everyone's just a normal person, but there's still that thing in the back of your mind going, wow, that's so-and-so, that's Trent Reznor, that's Kevin Shields, whatever these kind of people, and it's it's pretty great. Yeah, definitely. The Barras is a famous place in Glasgow uh, for a number of reasons, and that's where you got your first guitar. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone who might be tuning in here who isn't familiar with the Barras in that area of Glasgow, yeah. could you take us back in time a wee bit and describe what it was like to go to the Barland Market. And uh, obviously you had the Barland Ballroom, and as you yeah. say in your book, not far from Celtic Park. Yeah. It's a magical place. Yeah. Um, it's in the east end of Glasgow, which is like um, the most working class part of Glasgow. And I actually spent a lot a lot of time there. I had an, two aunties in Toe Cross that I would stay with a lot. Um because my folks were really busy, so I'd spend a bit of time in the East End, and I would go to the bars almost every weekend with my dad. My dad bought and sold telescopes as well as just making them, so he'd be looking out for old binoculars, old mm -hmm. telescopes. He'd also go there was a still is a tool store there, Bill's Tool Store. So I would go there with him, and I was into when I first started going, just being into Star Wars toys and maybe comics, and just hanging with my dad and eating really rubbishy food that my mum would really not be happy about his eating <laughs> <laughs> uh, rolls and sausage and such like um, and yeah it, it's the bar is back then was very busy it's still there it's actually it's kind of changing a wee bit it's, it's kind of semi trendy now yeah uh, but it still has that old old uh, kind of roughness and kind of unusualness about it as well but it was so busy and I would go there all the time and and that, yeah, when I started getting into music and I had an acoustic guitar and uh, got guitar lessons and I really wanted an electric guitar because I was getting into music and my dad my dad got me one one, one weekend for £50. Was that a life-changing moment? No, at the time. The time was a great moment. Um, I got a new guitar today, actually. It was brilliant. So any t any <laughs> day where you get a new guitar is a good, a, a, a good day, but... Um, I don't think that was a life-changing moment because I think at that time I was into loads of things. I was into, I was into swimming. Mm -hmm. I was a big swimmer. I was into karate. Um, I played football a wee bit, although I was terrible because I'm so small. And uh, just get battered off the ball. But um, it, w it was definitely something... Yeah, it felt pretty special. It felt, felt pretty special. See, when you're talking about uh, this commitment you seem to have or an obsession with music as well as some of the other activities that you've uh, listed there, you would do almost anything to get into gigs. That's what I, th I thought when I was reading <laughs> through this, the commitment, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the long hair, you could, and I you think your sister suggested you could pass as an 18-year-old girl. Yeah, they, dry, they, they dressed me up as a lassie to get me out of the barrel <laughs> is the is the bottom line. Because I was so wee. I'm still not very big, but I was really wee. And... Uh, I think it was my sister or one of her pals, and they were like, just come put your hair over your face, and they'll just think you're a lassie. And I remember thinking, oh, you're probably right. And lo and behold, I got in. I mean, you there's no way. In. Yeah, and actually, a few friends of mine, I think Do maybe Dominic or maybe one of Dominic's pals, definitely had not got into gigs, mm -hmm. you know, because I think if you kind of got that kind of big boyish face, there's no way anyone's thinking, thinking you're 18, but if you're just a tiny wee thing with just your hair over your face they're probably not gonna they're not gonna ask or they well, didn't ask see see another thing I'm gonna ask you Stuart is you, you describe how these bands made a real impression on you I mean mm -hmm. you've mentioned The Cure yeah. Jesus and Mary Chain Primal Scream mm -hmm. Nirvana 
Yeah. And you talk about your experience of going to see them live. Yeah. And the excitement you had about getting the album when the albums were uh-huh. coming out and the impact that these bands had on your life. Uh-huh. Does it occur to you that you're doing the exact same to fans getting into your music coming to see your life? I can't even think it's the exact same. I can't, maybe I'm just such, still got that, I'm such a fan. But I, I know people are, I know people are really fond of our band and I, I, I never take that for granted. I, I don't. And even, and, and also because our band's been going a long time now, we'll meet people who've grown up with their music, who saw us at gigs that, that we remember as not being that good. Mm. I mean, I remember we, um, we went on tour with the, with the Manic Street Preachers and the band treated us really well, but we weren't really the fans' cup of tea, to put it mildly. But I've met so many folk over the years that like that, seeing that gig changed how I thought about music because up until that point, I'd never heard anything that wasn't from the charts or whatever, you know, mainstream kind of music. So, no, I do, I do, I, I, I do appreciate it, although I don't, I can't go about thinking. I'm too Scottish to be running about <laughs> thinking that we're as good as any of those bands, you know. I love how uh, you describe how you got your first gyro check um, <laughs> and you obviously committed that again to your musical career uh-huh. um, and it worked out not too bad to yeah. be fair yeah. um, and as with a lot of bands you had a couple of incarnations a couple of bands prior to, to Mogwai yeah. and I always love the names of previous bands Stuart yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are these things that looking back on do you still have some of the old tapes that you might have knocked up with your, your old bands I definitely would have some Dead Cat Motorbike tapes because that was we were I was probably 17, 18 when, when that band was going the other band, Pregnant Nun, was not really a band. That was just me and my pals playing other folk songs. But it was it was great fun, which is what music is, mm-hmm. you know. It's, it's great fun and that experience of getting together with your pals and just making music, even if it's somebody else's songs, it's 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 such a great experience. And, and loads of folk do it. I'm just lucky enough that I managed to keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, you're a big uh, movie fan. You see that throughout the book that, you know, you're name checking a lot of films that were maybe uh, influential to you. But one film um, was from the 1980s, from my era, and you've decided to go with uh, Gremlins, with Mogwai. And it was after the event you, you realised that there was a different meaning to that, that word as well, a darker meaning. Well, a, a slightly more intellectual meaning as well, because, I mean... I think I, I just thought it was I liked the be cute thing from the from the from the Gremlins, but Martin, our drummer, um, worked in a Chinese restaurant in East Kilbride, and uh, it was after he joined the band, and and he, his bosses told him that it meant devil or ghost. I guess words don't have exact definitions, do they? But so I always thought that was pretty good. Also meant we couldn't get sued, which was always a concern I had that Joe Dante, um, who'd made Gremlins, might decide to sue us. <laughs> but again, there's the dark and the light to that name. Yeah. You've got this wee furry character from an 80s movies, but mm-hmm. there's a darker side of it, some kind of demonic uh, word from um, China. And when you start getting that band together, um, there's a lot of people in that book that I was unaware of that really helped you in the early days. Yeah. Um, and Alex, a lot of people will know from Franz Ferdinand. Yeah. Massive influence on yeah, you yeah. in the early yeah. days. Uh-huh. Uh, was it good to be able to go back and give these people credit? 13th Note, massively influential as well. I think, so, especially Alex, because, I mean, Alex is now a big pop star, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't mind me describing him as that, and people maybe don't realise how integral he was to the underground music scene in Glasgow in the 1990s. He booked the, booked the bands in the 13th Note, and he did the sound, and he... Helped out, played in other bands, played in the Yummy Far. Um, even he's definitely drove about Urusai Yatsura, really, and really helped people and championed people. Mm-hmm. And you know, and Paul, who 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 was the drummer in Franz Ferdinand as well, like they'd been in loads and loads of bands. So when when they did hit it big, it was really a big celebration. You know, sometimes when folk kind of get massive success people can be a bit eye rolly about it but everyone was so happy for them and uh yeah it's good and uh, alex alex was helpful for me in the book too because my memory's not that good um i did have to do a bit of research 
and uh, it was good. It was good. It, it, it was good chatting to Alex, and it was good chatting to a lot of my old friends and talking to my bandmates who I talk to all the time, but not about old things from twenty odd years ago or whatever. So um, yeah, I, I really, I really like that part of the process. Yeah. See, when you're looking at some of your early experimentation with drugs, for example. Um, was it a difficult decision to include that kind of thing in your book? You're laying it all bare there for family members to, uh, to well, read into. That, that, I, I wasn't massively uh, looking forward to giving my mum the book. But, I mean, I've not... I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, I hope I've not... I've not treated the subject too lightly, but I've never had a, an addiction problem or anything like that. So all, all of that stuff is more just a bit of a prop to all the daft stuff that happened around it rather than my drug hell because it's, it's not really and I gave all that stuff up a long time ago but um, yeah and that's I think that's one of the reasons the book concentrates quite a lot in the early years of the band because mm -hmm. that's when we were really young and daft and the funny things happened you know so uh, the fact we're all off our nut probably didn't help <laughs> what I also love about it is uh, right you love music, let's get a band together. So you put a band together, let's do a demo. Um, how do we release this? Let's set up a record label. Yeah. A real DIY yeah, kind yeah, yeah. of um, outlook to, to music. Uh -huh. um, and was that driven by you, Stuart? Was that, was that your mentality? Listen, I'll just do it myself. You know what? It was the culture at the time. Mm -hmm. At the time, Glasgow wasn't seen as a very cultural place and it wasn't seen by the music industry which was in London as somewhere to go and find bands mm -hmm. so really it was like well if we want to if we want to have a band and do what the bands that we love did we're going to have to do it ourselves you know even look a few years earlier at, at at folk like Alan McGee, Alan went to London, you know, I don't know if Alan could have done what he did at that point with Creation Records in, in Glasgow. Maybe he could, but it, 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 it was only really with Chemical Underground that st staying in Glasgow was something that was taken seriously, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, it, it kind of, it's quite hyperbolic but it's it's almost a little bit like what Tony Wilson did with Manchester I think you know because I think the, the music scene, scene in Scotland now is very self-contained yeah and it wasn't at the time it was almost it was almost oh, as soon as your band started doing well yeah you need to go to London and yeah. that was that was the attitude that's great I mean when you're talking about chemical underground and there's um there's a few different bands who come and go uh, throughout your story one being Arab Strap one of the most amusing things, maybe it shouldn't have been amusing, was when you realised that um, two of the band members were actually at a, a public meeting for the UFO sightings over Bonnie Bridge. So you went along. Me and, and Dominic. You, and, so there was two members in Mogwai there and two members of Arab Strat. Aye. Um, was we, there real concerns that there was UFOs flying aye. over Bonnie Bridge? I've never seen anything like it. I mean, we were really interested in UFOs. Me and Dominic had seen something really weird on the... Back road between uh, Lanark and Edinburgh. We were really into UFOs. and uh, But this thing in Bonnie Bridge was something else. People were freaking out. It was proper pitchfork. Pitchfork stuff. And there was these two guys just absolutely taking the piss. And then years later, we found out it was Aidan and Malcolm. And uh, obviously our paths crossed um, with both our bands being on the same label, touring together. And both bands on the same label again now with us putting out the... The Arab Strap Records on Rock Action, but yeah, I like that. I like the fact that it's kind of mischief making and 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 weirdness even before we knew who any anyone was. I do remember the the press being in a bit of a lather over that. Uh, I'm not quite sure if there are a lot of sightings in Bron Bonnie Bridge. I'd need to check. <laughs> um, another thing I found really interesting is your connection to Michael Brennan, a fellow Fifer. Yep. Um, I remember Michael running a studio out of Cowdenbeath. Yep. And I think he moved that down to Rosyth. Uh, and that, again, you had the Super Furry Animals link as well, and yeah. you eventually collaborated with the, the Super Furry Animals. I mean, what's your memories of that? Because you said there that a lot of people in the music industry aren't particularly nice people, but they were. Yeah, they're they're the real deal. Super Furry Animals are, are genuinely 
interesting, smart, talented folk that didn't have any time for the music industry, even though they were on a big label, like they were getting the money and spending it on tanks and dressing up like dogs or whatever. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they were in the best possible way weirdos. And uh, I like the fact that Michael, it would have been Michael that introduced us to them, but, but also like Michael had, Michael had been out doing sound. Michael probably did sound for so many of these gigs that I talk about as a teenager, mm. like Slow Dive and Ride and those kind of things, even before before I knew him. And uh, I, some, and his dad, Mick, as yeah. well. Yeah, mm. his dad, <laughs> he's in the book, had to, to run that by him after getting the, the legal report. But <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and, and we did a bit of recording as well up in the substation studio in Cowdenbeath. I think we did an EP there. Um, yeah, I think it's a great thing they do for the, the community up there. It's a great space as it well, is. isn't it? It definitely is. Um, again, another thing that comes through really clear is you've got a, a love affair with Reading Festival, don't mm -hmm. you? Uh, going back as a fan, seeing Nirvana there. Um, and all, also, the weekend that Celtic beat Rangers 6-2. Yeah. I was at Reading. Oh, I, believe, I believe you were at Leeds. But you weren't playing, were you? No, I wasn't playing. I went... I went, I went I jumped on Elasticus tour bus. I met them at the Glasgow. The, it used to be the three festivals for a few years, wasn't it? Glasgow, Reading and Leeds. And uh, I jumped on their tour bus. It must have been on the Friday. And then the game was on the Saturday. Is that right? And uh, the bus driver was a Rangers supporter. And uh, he wasn't coming to watch the game with me. I can't even mind who I went with. It was another crew guy. I don't know if it was someone with them, but we just went in. There. And I think we missed the first goal. We just went in and everyone was just going absolutely... Tonto, and we're like, what? I think it was a re it was mm -hmm. really early goal, and uh, yeah, all the Elastica folk thought I was nuts about how happy I was about this football game. But I mean, you obviously understand the significance. Absolutely, uh, it was a big, big day. And that weekend, um, people might argue with us, Stuart, but I think that was the ultimate primal screen lineup. Aye, uh, no, that no. performance I saw that weekend was, yeah, yeah. was stunning. Again, a wee bit going back to the, the question of the cure, you, you see the primal scream, you admired them. Um, how big an influence when you look at what they did after Scream of Delica or the Scream of Delica album being their third album, that mm. change in direction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that kind of say to you as a young musician, it's okay to do this? It's okay to do something a wee bit different? In retrospect, aye. And I mean, and, and, and also that kind of period, like late 90s, early 2000s, they kind of had another reinvention, hadn't they? Kind of exterminator time. And uh, they're also they were also very very nice to us because we were a good bit younger. But in retrospect, now knowing Bobby and Ennis, they probably maybe saw a, a bit of us and mm -hmm. a bit of them and us. And uh, yeah, they were they were very nice to us. And um, yeah, but, but they but they were really happy about six two as well, obviously. And uh, and I remember I think they, I think they told me. They, they, they were up all night with uh, Charlie Nicholas and and the, the Gallica brothers celebrating it. Is that right? And the, the other funny thing, which I'm sure you know, but uh, is that no Gallica thought that they played role with it at the end because he was there. Right. They played it every week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in tribute to no. Ah, you thought it was just because he was there. Fantastic. <laughs> and there, there was also that situation where Bobby was playing drums for Jesus and Mary Chain whilst mm -hmm. obviously being with Primal Screen, but you had a, a similar situation in Aye. the early days of Mogwai. Um, did it come yeah. to the point where you thought, I just need to concentrate 100% on my band? Yeah. I mean, I also didn't even own any drums, although I don't know if Bobby owned any drums. Um yeah, I was I was playing in my pal's band, Eska, and uh, it was great because I, I got to. They were they were probably a wee bit further. They'd been going a wee bit longer than us, and like we're getting a bit of interest. So I'd go down to London with them and met some people that kind of who ended up doing stuff with Mogwai as well. So you know, it was it was it was. It was pr probably Bobby found it. It's a wee bit too much. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he only really made one band. There's a lot of people now uh, getting into music and starting their own bands. They don't have things that you had back in the day, such as the NME, you know, where you would scour the, the pages of the NME. Mm -hmm. You would read about bands, but you'd not heard of them. Mm -hmm. um, you would you would seek them out when they played live. But also you had other elements like John Peel 
uh, mm. which is something that is no longer with us and probably hasn't been replaced, mm. Stuart. And they bemoan the fact that we've lost some of these um, f things that to a music fan and also to a band were very, very useful, very helpful. I mean, it was really helpful. I, I, but looking back now, it's just a different time, isn't it? It's just a different time. Even like... Um, like you said, if, if you wanted to hear hear a piece of music, you had to either buy the record or be lucky enough to be li listening to the radio when it got played. So, so the new the music papers had such an important role as tastemakers. Mm. One that they kind of abused at some points, I think, but it was so different, like to now. Like reviews now are if you get a great review, it's good. You can put it on the poster. But it's not going to kill your album because people are going to go and listen to it. Yeah. Whatever happens and make their own minds up. So it was a very, quite a cutthroat environment. Certainly very, very different to now. And uh, like most changes, some are good and some are bad. You know, like I personally think it's brilliant that we can go and play in Indonesia and everybody there can hear the music because they've all got YouTube, YouTube or Spotify or whatever. Yeah. But, um, on the negative side, you, fans just aren't selling anywhere near the amounts of records. But I, I do like the I do like the availability of music. Oh, definitely. I, I spoke to some musicians who say back in the day you would tour to support an album. It's almost flipped. Oh, it's so completely you release flipped. an album to go on tour. It's completely flipped. Yeah, yeah. For for in a lot of ways, the albums just merch. Mm. You know, it's mm -hmm. just the thing that somebody buys along with a t shirt. But um, I still think like. I think that's maybe applies more to kind of more established bands because for for newer bands they need to get known they need yeah. to go out there and play and and do all the same do all the same stuff, um, but there's definitely a lot more yeah there's a lot more money in live music than than there was then. That's interesting to look at the actual album as being just an item of merch. That, that really is interesting. Yeah. Um, you spoke about that bus load of people that uh, were going to watch The Cure and you were looking around and there was a certain hairstyle, there was a certain way that people would dress and it was like tribal. You yeah. were part of a tribe. But Mogwai have got that uh, yeah. as your fan base. You know, there's a lot of bands with a fan base, but it's not as tribal. You can almost spot. Uh, well, I mean, I showed you earlier a picture of my, my brother's forearm with a Mogwai tattoo. Yeah, I love you it. You know, they've committed it to their, uh -huh. their skin forever. How do you feel about that? Was that ever something that you thought was part of the master plan, Stuart? I mean, there wasn't a master plan because, to be honest, we were not, we were genuinely not sure MD was ever going to like the band. We just wanted to do it. We were just kind of sick of what was going on at the time and we were very, really into quite a few bands that had kind of become, I wouldn't say unfashionable, but certainly not part of the mainstream that was going on at the time, bands like Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine. So we, we didn't see any of that coming back. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like it's almost like the the internet has has changed the concept of what's cool and what's not cool. People just like what they like now. Mm -hmm. You know, and that tribalism is not quite it's not quite as sharp as it used to be. And and again, like most things, there's good things and bad things about that. But no, we were we I didn't think Andrew was going to be getting Mogwai tattoos. I, re I really didn't. I think it's I think it's magic, but that's not um, not something we we thought was going to happen. I was surprised uh, on the the release of your debut album that you were unsure of it. You were unsure of the reaction yeah, yeah. it might get. Yeah, yeah. Do you still have that sense of trepidation before a new album comes out? Sure, have you kind of leveled into a, a point where you're you're quite confident when you're releasing new music? Uh... I was more nervous about releasing the book, to be honest, because it was something I'd never done before. Um, with records, I think I, I, I think one of the reasons we were nervous about putting the first album out was that we weren't prepared and we, we, we'd, we'd made a lot of the records um, by the seat of our pants. And I, I think we've just, the lesson we've learned is to not do that and to, 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 um, be better prepared and uh, give things as much time as they need. Um, I'm not one of these, I'm definitely not one of these perfectionists because I think that you could just tinker with, with music forever and never put music out. Mm -hmm. I do think that you've got to give it a certain amount of time and then that's a snapshot of where you were, 
you know. And if it's not as good in retrospect, just try and make the the next one better. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I was a wee bit nervous because you fans fans have ups and downs, don't they? Like like everything in life, like football teams, yeah. like everything. Like you can't always be brilliant all the time. Um, so yeah, yeah, and that might not be something you're aware of until it's already happened. So I'm always I'm, I'm always um, conscious of that, but I'd say it probably manifests itself more as being grateful for what we do have, you know, rather than worrying about what we might not. Yeah. I mean, you've been prolific looking through your discography with the studio LPs, but mm -hmm. also the soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll be prolific with the writing, the, the process? You've now gone through it once, Stuart. Do you think mm -hmm. you'll do it again? I think I probably will. I've still not decided what it would be I mean the book ends about 10 years ago I think so I mean there's a, some stuff that's happened that I could write about um, but I actually just quite enjoyed the enjoyed the the process of getting up every day and writing a thousand words mm. so I think it may be interesting to try that with a different subject you know um, so I, I, I don't think I'll be super prolific though I don't think I'm going to be how many albums have I made like 15 I'm, 60, I'm, I'm not going to write in our 15 books <laughs> if I am I'm going to have to get started right now let's think about uh, one of the one of the soundtracks Zidane mm -hmm. uh, we are in the home of the Jimmy Johnson Academy if you were to write a soundtrack for a Celtic player which uh, Celtic player would it be Stuart? what would it be? I mean, I think the player that I've enjoyed the most, that's given me the most joy, was probably Lubo. Mm -hmm. I just, I just loved watching Maravchik. Um, just moments, of, wasn't he? He was a big moments guy, and uh, yeah, she just wasn't at Celtic when he was a wee bit younger. But I think of the current crop, oh, I don't know. Really, I'm really warm into Hatati. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, he's some guy. So yeah, I think it's. It's a good time to be a Celtic fan just now, isn't it? So there's a there's a lot of good players. So, but yeah, of 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 all the players I've seen, it'd probably be Lubo. Lubo, look forward to that soundtrack and the movie, of course, <laughs> uh, Stuart as well. Another thing, just before we wrap up, I was looking at um, a young guy like yourself, being surrounded by his mates, um, going on that journey. It's like everything's going up upwards trajectory. Uh, you're on tour. You're traveling Europe. You're traveling the world. There's drugs and there's and there's alcohol and all this kind of stuff then you need to come back to your normal life yeah after that how difficult is it um to go from the hedonistic mm -hmm. kind of tour and music and getting that buzz on stage to coming back home and living a, a normal life uh, i mean sometimes it's a relief because just just especially when you get in your 40s you're just knackered but um i, I think it's the, the the thing that I struggle with most is having loads to do and then suddenly not having things to do. And to be honest, I keep myself fairly busy, so it doesn't happen too much. But yeah, that's that's the one thing. Actually, coming home, it's really nice to be back with your family and out walking the dogs and being able to go and see Celtic or go be able to go and see your pal's band playing when mm -hmm. they're playing or just things that... that people who don't have a job that requires them to be away a lot maybe take for granted and I also don't take for granted being lucky enough to be able to gallivant the world making music so but it's, it's, it's nice to be home when you've been away for a wee while well hopefully in a downtime Stuart you will get on to that second book because this was a fantastic read well done congratulations thank you very um, much could you tell our viewers where to where to pick this up I www.mogwai.scot would be my recommendation straight from source straight from, Get source, it straight from source thankfully <laughs> thankfully um i've got a, an orange copy apparently there's also a green copy a wee bit and a red one and, and a red, red one. one as well get your copy of this book it's a fantastic read thank you Stuart Braithwaite for joining us on a state of mind thanks paul almost said a celtic state of mind <laughs>